Hi, I'm Jean Schumacher and I'm founder of Simply Plan Based, where I have a lot of programs to help you to change your health destiny. And coming soon, we're going to be launching the Pregnancy Advantage, where we're going to be helping women to get their bodies pregnant ready. And today I have with me, oh my gosh, her name is Dr. Lee Frame. She's the Program Director of Integrative Medicine, Executive Director of the Office of Integrative Medicine and Health. This is where she brings nutrition and immunity together through clinical and translational research at the George Washington School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Dr. Frame earned her Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry. Uh, I just want to say I didn't do well in that. Just okay. saying. <laughs> no quizzes, right? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, she's a double graduate of Johns Hopkins, where she earned a master's in molecular biology and immunology and a doctorate in international health with a focus on human nutrition. Wow. So, Dr. Frame, thank you so much for taking the time to be with me today. Absolutely. Talking about one of my favorite topics. Oh, my God, right? I mean, it's just becoming such a, a hot buzzword out in the world because we're talking about today the gut biome and what better person to talk to about, I mean, than Dr. Frame. So let's start with the basics. What, what is the microbiome in the first place? That's a, a very good place to start. What is the microbiome? Right. I think people have probably heard about it. A lot of people are saying that 2019 was the year of the microbiome. They might think it has something to do with bacteria, but they're not really sure. So the way we typically describe it is the bugs that live on us and in us. Um, so it's bacteria, it's viruses, it's fungi, anything that lives on us and in us. And it's a, a very important part of our health, which is what I think we're going to talk about today. So you mean I've got this like microbiome on me right now? How, how big is this thing? What are we talking here? You know, that's a great question. There, there are a lot of estimates out there about how big it is. And, and some of them are basically just really good guesses. And there was a, a study not too long ago that tried to actually get a more scientific estimate. And what we're saying is it's probably about the same as the number of cells in your body. So there's a, as many of them as there are of you. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> wow. That's kind of creepy. You know, yeah, a little no. bit. Let's go. I almost have this vision of did you ever see the movie Men in Black? Yeah. When he opens up the, the cabinet and there's the <laughs> little the little marble inside or whatever it was, and they're like, yeah. hail, you know. <laughs> Except for there'd be a lot more of them. <laughs> well, is this human microbiome is an example of like symbiosis? Yes, that is exactly what it is. We are their hosts. They live on us and in us, but they're also providing us a lot of benefits as well. One of the things that, that we're doing for them is providing them shelter, a place to live, but we're also providing them food. So when we're eating or we're moving around the world, that's how they're getting their food. And they're actually helping us with our food too, which is kind of crazy. There are a lot of things in food that we can't digest without the bacteria in our gut. And so they help with that. We call that energy harvesting. They get up to 10% of your calories for you that you wouldn't otherwise absorb, which for some of us is a good thing. And for some of us, maybe we don't really want that so much, but <laughs> that's a whole other question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can I get more? Or can I get more of these? Right, right. Yeah, so that, that, that's a good thing historically, and maybe now it's becoming kind of a bad thing because we live in a, a society where we're generally a little more sedentary and food is everywhere, so it's not as much of a good thing as it used to be. But they also do something else involved in food is they actually make or at least make available a lot of vitamins and minerals. So even if we eat a healthy diet, we wouldn't get all the vitamins and minerals we needed without our gut microbiome. And that's especially true for B vitamins and vitamin K2. Wow. I had no clue about that. Oh my gosh. Is this like new? I mean, like finding out about this or? It, it sort of is new. The, the B vitamins less so. The K2 definitely new. We actually didn't even know there was a vitamin K2. Just thought it was vitamin K for quite some time. So now we realize it's vitamins K. K1 being the one we typically talk about with green leafy vegetables and K2 being the one that comes from bacteria that's, or any sort of fermented food. Uh, one of the big ones they talk about is natto, which is a Japanese food where they ferment soybean, just chock full of K2 and it's all from the bacteria. Wow. So soybeans are also good for you. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. How many different microbes are there in the human gastrointestinal tract? 
So there's no exact number yet that we know of, but through a new technology like next generation sequencing, we know that there are thousands of different kinds of bacteria. So it's a very large number. And I imagine as our technology improves and we do more research, that number might even grow. Wow. Yeah. So, so where did I get this microbiome? I mean, I know I didn't go shopping at Kmart and pick <laughs> up anything. I mean, maybe someday, but um, not yet. No. Most people get their microbiomes from their mom. Typically, you get your microbiome during the birthing process. But what's really interesting is with modern medicine and changes in birthing practices, that's actually starting to change. Some practices, one of the more maybe extreme of, of them is including cesarean section, where you're really not getting that exposure to the birth canal. They've shown that the gut microbiome of those babies is actually more similar to the skin microbiome of the doctor delivering them than it is to the gut microbiome of their mother. Yes. Are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding. How is that transmitted from the doctor? I mean, like, usually aren't they in like gloves? and? Yes, absolutely. But you know, it's on us and in us. So it, it, we're bringing it with us everywhere. It's getting on the scrubs. And so as soon as you touch that baby, they're getting exposed to it. And they didn't have, well, it's sort of debated whether they had any bacteria in the, in the womb, but probably very, very small amounts if they have any at all. And so now these bacteria are getting in there and there's nothing there to stop them. So they just take hold and grow. Oh my gosh. Well, I think a little bit just talking about you touching base on the cesarean section, because I know my children were born in Columbia. I was working at private American schools overseas. Oh, wow. And so my kids were born there. And I had a very progressive where they gave, where I gave birth. They would give birth in the water. You uh -huh. know, so that was an amazing birth there. But most women in Columbia opt for C-sections. Yes. I actually it's, didn't know that. There's a study about that. That's why I knew that. In uh, Colombia? In Colombia, because it's becoming so popular that women are choosing it and scheduling it that it's a population you can actually study the effect of cesarean section on the gut microbiome because there are enough women that are having it electively there. I know. I mean, and that's how it was because it, at first, when I, when I went to go have birth for my second child at the same clinic, and this was a natural childbirth clinic and they had all kinds of ways, the, the doctor tells me, he calls me into the office and, you know, like after the last, you know, at the last month you're going in for the, the weekly checkups. Mm -hmm. He says, I have some bad news for you. And I'm like, that's not the thing you say to a pregnant woman. You know? <laughs> yeah, really? I'm like, oh my God, he's got two heads. What's going on? You know? <laughs> yeah. He said, no, we're closing the clinic. And then my due date was June or January 14th. And he said, you know, we're closing the clinic on December 31st. And I'm like, you don't know you can't do this to me and so he said just go to the, to the regular clinic and that was one of the first questions that they asked me at the at the hospital you know did you want to schedule a cesarean and i'm like no <laughs> why <laughs> why would i want somebody to cut me open right if you don't need to it's it's there for the women that that need it i mean if there's an emergent medical emergency my right. life is in danger hack at me you know exactly. at it. but not just for fun <laughs> Just so I can schedule on my vacation? And that is a large, yes, that's a large part of it is it's, it's difficult yeah. to take time off from work and they want to be able to do it on their terms. Exactly. That, and I just was horrified, you know, yeah. when I found that out. But anyway. Yeah, I, I agree. It's generally pretty horrifying, but it's been pretty good for science. So I guess we have that as a plus side because <laughs> otherwise we would just wouldn't have enough women to study it in to really get to the answers about these questions. Interesting. Mm -hmm. that they are actually studying this in Colombia. Who knew? Yes, yes. Who knew? Wow. Okay. So how long does it take these new babies to fully develop? Because they don't come out of the chute fully developed, right? Correct. The, the thing about the microbiome is it's actually, it's a lot like the body. It's, it's a continual process. So there's not really an end point per se. You know, even once you've reached puberty as an adult, you're still kind of developing, your body is changing, your gut microbiome is doing the same thing. So whatever you're exposing it to is going to either help in that process or lead you down the wrong path, which may lead to disease or gut issues. Like what would be going down the wrong path? What kind of foods so, like are we talking about that would? That's a, a great question. There's, there's lots of ways to go down the wrong path, unfortunately. 
But luckily, the, the right path is a little easier. The main thing you need for your gut microbiome is fiber. That's what the microbiome eats is what they live on. So if you have a high fiber diet and it, it's a pretty varied diet, so you're getting lots of different nutrients and you're not you know, only eating broccoli, which is lovely, but you can't live on broccoli alone, then you're probably doing good things for your microbiome. But if you're not giving them enough fiber, which you know the vast majority of Americans are not having enough fiber in their diet, then you are leading your microbiome down the wrong path because they're basically starving. The ones that survive are the ones that live on alternate fuel and they frequently have some sort of negative health outcome that could be gut upset, that could be gut cancer, it could be that it leads you down some sort of disease pathway where you develop, uh, they're linking all sorts of things to the gut microbiome now. Even some neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's may be linked to the gut microbiome. So if you're not taking care of it, you could in the long run see some detriment from it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. All of that is still emerging, so it's really hard to say. Like, I can't say that, you know, if you don't eat enough fiber, your gut microbiome isn't going to be good and you're going to get Parkinson's. But there's, in some people, that does seem to be what's happening. Why does this microbiome matter? Why does it matter? Well, think of it this way. Since we've discovered, really, the microbiome and the importance of it, we've been referring it basically to as another organ. So it's like another organ in your body. So if your liver, for instance, became diseased, you could imagine that some bad things would happen. You wouldn't be able to function properly. You wouldn't be detoxifying properly. You probably wouldn't feel very good. Very similar with the gut microbiome. If it's not functioning properly, you're not going to be able to get all the nutrients that you need. You might have inflammation, which we know is the link of many different diseases. Probably just not going to feel very good. And that can lead to all sorts of really interesting things. Some studies are even linking it to things like depression and mental illness. Wow. Yes. So it's a very wide reaching and it's going to be different in each person, which is also very interesting. And that's part of the reason it's difficult to study is the reaction for each person is slightly different in part because their microbiome is, is slightly different. Well, every body, every person is different. Exactly. I mean, you know, in what they eat, their environment, the chemicals. Oh my God. I mean, that's my forte is chemicals. You know, my background is chemistry, not biochemistry, <laughs> just to say it. But it, it was, because that was an impressive, you know, when back in the day, and that was a long, you know, when Columbus came over on the Mayflower. Was it the Mayflower? No, that was wrong. With Pilgrims, that was the Pilgrims. Oh, the Pilgrims yeah. came over on the Mayflower. You know, that's like when I took courses back in the day. So I'm sure everything <laughs> has changed you know, that they know so much more since I took my, my courses in my undergrad. Every day is like they learn more every day. It's hard uh, to keep yeah. up. It, right. I mean, the amount of information that's coming out is just absolutely incredible mm -hmm. about how important this is. And so, uh, well, how, how can I tell if my microbiome is healthy? That's a great question. And I think that's probably the million dollar question. That's what everyone is asking and everyone wants to know. Right now, we're not very good at defining what a healthy quote unquote microbiome might be because it's difficult to be sure that someone is healthy, right? If we look at them right now and they look like a healthy person and their microbiome is then considered healthy, but what if they develop cancer down the road or they develop Parkinson's disease? Does that mean at that point in time their microbiome was healthy or is that the microbiome that leads to disease? So it's a little bit difficult to tease that out, but the one thing that we do all seem to agree on is diversity. So the, the number of different kinds of bacteria or fungi or whatever that you have in your microbiome seems to be closely related with what we would consider to be a healthy microbiome. So right now, that's all we could say. And there are companies out there that will sequence your microbiome for you and let you know what's in there. And right now, it's, it's just very interesting, right? There's not a lot we can say for sure about it, other than if you look at your diversity index, if it's, if, if it's relatively low, and they'll, they'll, they'll have some sort of ranking system that you can look at, then you probably need to change your diet and your lifestyle to be a little bit more diverse and be a little bit more kind to your microbes and hopefully that index will go up but right now that's unfortunately all we can really say well what's that mean be kind to your microbiome what are we talking here yeah by taking uh, them out for a sauna you know <laughs> the girls day out movie dinner what are we talking yeah that's that's a great point 
uh, again, emerging area. So it's really, it's difficult to say that specifically, but it's a lot of the things that are good for you in general. And that's one thing I think that's really interesting about the microbiome field is it seems to be confirming a lot of the things we know about the human body in general. Like the reason that nutrition is good for you, we're finding out a lot of it is because of the effects on the gut microbiome. So we're not totally reinventing the wheel. It's a lot of things you're already hearing, you know, don't smoke, don't expose yourself to a lot of pesticides, eat a, a diverse diet, don't eat a lot of the same foods because you're getting exposed to the same toxic chemicals or heavy metals, things like that mm -hmm. will probably also affect your microbiome. Well, what happens to our gut flora microbiome when we're on a plant-based diet versus an animal-based diet? So first I have to clarify that there is more than one kind of plant-based and more than one kind of animal-based diet. So junketarians do right. not do well. <laughs> um, that's actually one of my big things. I'm, I'm really big about diet quality. Personally, I think right. diet quality is the most important thing because you can eat a, a bad plant-based diet. Um, well, I think, that, I, I, you know, like, you know, potato chips and Coca-Cola, you know, exactly. are vegan and, exactly. you know, I think, I think we all can agree that that is not a healthy choice. <laughs> right, exactly. So I have to make that caveat because I feel like otherwise you get people writ large, just eat anything they want as long as it's made from a plant, which is not exactly true. But that being said, plants are really where all the good things come from for your gut microbiome. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for the fiber and different kinds of fiber. So that's another reason you need to have different kinds of food. So you're getting different kinds of fiber. They're also looking at the phytonutrients. So chemicals that are found in plants, like for instance, resveratrol and red wine. A lot of people have heard of that one. Yeah, so I also love red wine. So it's a great excuse for me to have my glass. And that we found that the vast majority of those compounds get to the microbiome. The health benefits that we get from them may actually be through the gut microbiome. So yeah, so they're really interested in things that are coming from plants and they're not so interested in everything else. Okay. Well, what about like an animal-based diet? I mean, you know, the sad, the standard American diet, yeah, heavily American processed, diet. you know, lots of dairy, meat. Mm -hmm. So what you see when you look at someone who's on a standard American diet is a very low diversity. They have like a very small number of bugs and many of them are the bugs that we consider to be unhealthy. So the ones that tend to promote obesity or diabetes or heart disease. So we can, we can be pretty clear that that's not a healthy microbiome. We can, we're good at identifying a non-healthy microbiome, and that is one. But the good news is you can change that with diet. So just because they have an unhealthy microbiome now doesn't mean that all is lost. If they switch to a whole foods plant-based diet, that's going to change. It takes a little bit of time, but it will change. How much time are we talking? Great question. So the gut microbiome is pretty resistant to change. It, it, you know, you can't just knock it out in, in one day. You're not going to change your diet in one day and have everything completely change. But over a period of, say, six months, that's going to be a long-term change to your gut microbiome. So if you can commit to something for, I mean, heck, probably even like three months, you're going to see a really important change. But at six months, it's going to be a more long-term change at that point. Yeah. Well, I've seen changes just in, in a minimal, minimum of 10 days, you know, like on blood work. I mean, like people's mm -hmm. cholesterols have changed. You know, mm -hmm. I had one client who went from 279 in cholesterol to 99 oh, in, that's amazing. in three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, it's just incredible. I mean, what, what plants can do. I mean, especially like you said, eating from the rainbow, you know. Yeah. I mean, I guess grandma was, you know, always right. You know, she was always right. Yes. I say that all the time. I'm like, just listen to what your grandmother said because she was right. right. <laughs> I say, like, we're not reinventing the wheel. Like I, a lot of this is old wisdom and, you know, we figured it out over thousands of years. Except, <laughs> except post-World War II, you know, better living through modern so, chemistry. It sounded like a good idea. <laughs> it was going to make women have free time, but... Yeah, that didn't work out so well. No, it didn't. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. So what, okay, I know a lot of people are getting sick and they turn to antibiotics to treat disease. Mm -hmm. What is that doing to our gut biome? Great question. So the, a very similar answer to diet, actually, it depends on how long you are on it. And this is one of the, the great things for public health is a short exposure for antibiotics. Say you're on them for even up to a week. As soon as you stop taking them, your gut microbiome starts to recover. 
Like, so it's not a permanent change. And that's, goodness. that's the same thing with diet, right? So if you switch to a healthy diet for 14 days and then you go back to eating whatever you were eating before, that change isn't permanent. So you kind of need to, to instate that for a long period of time for it to really stick. But that's great because then with antibiotics, you can take them for when you need them, get off them, get back on your healthy diet and your gut biome will go back to being healthy. Well, what about all the, the antibiotics they're using in animals now? Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's potentially a problem. There's not a ton of research looking at the role of that on the gut microbiome. It's kind of one step removed, but chronic exposure to antibiotics is probably not healthy. Uh, and we do have studies that anything over six months, it starts to show that you're going to have some sort of dysbiosis. And I personally worry about people who are taking antibiotics for, instance, for acne. They're taking <gasps> them for a long period of time. Um, that's concerning. And I would imagine if you're eating a lot of CAFO beef, you're probably also getting some at least low exposure of antibiotics, and that's probably not going to help your gut microbiome at the very least. I know because I see because I'm in the classroom and I'm teaching still, and I see these poor kids coming in, their faces are just covered. And you just and you that didn't used to be the case, right? That's kind of something new as well is how bad acne has gotten and how rampant it is. It's true, mm -hmm. it's true, and I see it all the time. And the poor kids are just like, what can I do? And I'm like, I know yeah. part of it's diet, a large diet. part of it's diet. Yeah. yeah. Well, did you ever see the video with Nina and Randa Nelson? No. Oh, yeah. I'll have to share it with you. Yes, please These do. two ladies, they're both, they were both raised vegan and they pretty much through high school escaped their basic acne. Once their hormones started kicking in their faces, I mean, they were, and they're beautiful girls. They're mm -hmm. absolutely stunningly beautiful girls. And they're like, what is it? You know, we have a clean diet. Yeah, they thought they were but doing everything right. They thought they were doing everything right. But, you know, they were eating things, you know, they were still eating some oils, you know, high fat things, you know, avocados, high soy products, things like that. They went to Dr. McDougall's website and started consulting about that. And they're like, he's like, get the fat, get the oils out. They did. And Oh my gosh. Like, like night and day. Like night oh, and day. Wow. Like, in, like in, they said, I think they said in three days, they had no more new breakouts at all. Wow. And their faces cleared up like, like to beat the band. I mean, it was mm -hmm. absolutely stunningly beautiful to see that. And they actually have a program now. I think it's called the clear skin diet, something like that. Mm -hmm. And so they're promoting, you know, whole food plant-based, you know, obviously no oil. So mm -hmm. to help clear up the skin. Oh, that's fantastic. I, I definitely feel like, I don't know, in general, I feel like you got to start with the diet, no matter what, what disease we're talking about. Make sure that you're giving your body the fuel and the building blocks that it needs. And then we can start building anything else we need on top of that. Well, after you take a round of antibiotics, is it a good idea to take probiotics after that? Great question. About a, a year ago, I would have given you a different answer, but there's actually been a study coming out showing that taking probiotics after antibiotics slows the recovery rate back to what the gut microbiome looked before. Yeah. But we don't know whether what they had before was healthy. So that's the oh, other question. Yeah. It's a little hard to say, but anything that slows recovery maybe isn't a good thing. And so right now I'm a little bit torn, but I said, if you're going to take a probiotic, probably do it from a food source like kimchi or natto or something like that, where you're, How about you're getting... Uh, yeah, any sort of yogurt, absolutely. Some sort of naturally fermented product, just because we've been exposed to them for so many thousands of years that that's probably a, a safe way to get them. And plus, we really just don't know enough to really make good probiotics yet. There are a lot of companies out there that are trying, but it's difficult to know exactly what bugs we have to put in there because that science is still emerging. I think we're going to get there and we're, we're in the process of getting there, but right now it's a little bit difficult to figure out, you know, what probiotics should you be taking? Wow. This is like, like the new frontier. It is. It is. And, and I think sometimes people get a little frustrated that I can't just give them an answer. And it's like, I would love to just give you an answer, but it probably would be wrong, you know, right. or I at least don't know if it's wrong. And I don't, I don't think that's how we want to live our lives of just guessing I feel like yeah. we, we can do the best that we can from what we know. This is what I teach my students all the time. It's about evidence base. If we have the evidence for it, absolutely go for it. But if we don't, it's really difficult to say whether we should or should not try something. 
Well, that's one of the things I tell my students, like in chemistry, don't mix anything together unless you know what the outcome is going to be. <laughs> that's you know? a very good point. Well, actually, I mean, that, this is basically chemistry, right? Nutrition is chemistry. We're putting chemicals into our body and, and hopefully good outcomes are happening. Right. Okay. Well, one of the things I'm very passionate about is, you know, I talk about what I call a trifecta. So you have to change what goes in. So food, mm -hmm. drink, you have to change that. And you have to change what goes on because like in 26 seconds, something's absorbed into your bloodstream. And I'm mm -hmm. very passionate about the toxins that we're being exposed to from personal care products mm -hmm. to you know, all these things, environmental toxins that we're being exposed to. And that is one of my, my passions is these environmental toxins. So uh, one of the things that as a elementary principal at one point, that was one phase of my career. and it, the they would send home these lists of stuff that they wanted parents to send in. And on that was hand sanitizers. And I get this, oh. you know, like mm -hmm. it, as an elementary school, like trying to Germs get- Germs are everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> the bad ones, yeah, the bad yeah. ones. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, just like, oh my God, they're just <laughs> coughing on you, hacking, sneezing on you. I mean, it was so pleasant. But trying to get first graders to get into the cafeteria to have lunch, you know, and to have them wash their hands with yeah. soap and water before that, that's an hour right there. I yeah. mean, you know, yeah. to get uh, 30 kids, you know, lined up, washed hands and into the, the cafeteria. So the teachers would just go down the line ch -ch 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 with the mm -hmm. hand sanitizers and they would do that four or five times a day. Oh, that's a lot. I, well, and I understand what they were trying to do, you know, because they were trying to stop the spread of, yeah. you know, especially because they're not trained at that age, like six, seven, eight years old, old to, you know, wipe your nose on a <laughs> tissue and throw that tissue. Not on your sleeve. Yeah. Yeah, not on your sleeve. <laughs> you know, don't no cough on Johnny, you know, mm -hmm. or don't sneeze into the room. You know, these basic things that takes us, you know, even in high school, that's a standard rule in my classroom. Because the first sneeze of the year, yeah, I'm like, okay, we're going to go like this. You sneeze yeah. into your shirt because you're not going to have time to go find a tissue. Sneeze into your shirt. True. That's my rule in the classroom. And they know it now. I mean, without question, if somebody like sneezes, hey, sneeze into your shirt. <laughs> you know? like, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> they show that there's a great video. It's called the sneeze in slow motion. Oh, yes, I've seen that. That's disgusting. <laughs> like, I don't do that. I'm like, uh, uh, yes, yes, you do. <laughs> yes, you do. You're a human being. That's how you sneeze. Yes, exactly. So, I, you know, triclosan is one of those ingredients. And actually, it was banned, but it's still yes. being used. It and is. This is, it's, a, it's an antibacterial agent that's used in a lot of household products. Mm -hmm. So how does triclosan affect the human biome? So triclosan is an antibacterial. It's also an antifungal. So it's going to hit the, the fungus in your, your microbiome as well. And there's not a ton of research out there in part because like what you're saying, it's been banned. So they sort of stopped paying attention to it in terms of the gut microbiome. However, it is still allowed in toothpaste. And I've seen it in deodorants. Oh, have you seen it in deodorant? Oh, that's interesting. But in, in, in toothpaste, they allow it because it's been shown to potentially prevent gingivitis. However, if you're chronically exposing your oral microbiome to that, you could see where that's definitely going to have an effect. Um, and anything you do to your oral microbiome can also affect your gut microbiome. So it's definitely a concern. There is some research out there showing there's potentially negative health effects associated with that, including uh, inflammation of the gut. So we're starting to understand the oral exposure, but not so much the topical exposure, but probably not a great idea. I know there has been research showing that it's absorbed in the blood, so we know that. And having something like that in your blood, probably not a good idea. Your body was not designed to have that. So if we can avoid that, it's probably best to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And I tell the kids about this, you know. I actually found a company that was started by a girl who was 15 years old, who she had read the environmental working group. They had done a body burden mm -hmm. test on teenagers. And oh, on average, uh I mean, I think it was like 289 chemicals that they had oh found my gosh. in the bloodstream on average from all the personal care products. I mm -hmm. mean, if you think about it, like a shampoo, that's got like, I don't know, 10, 15 chemicals in it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and some of these chemicals, when they mix and that's the shampoo, imagine all the others they're using too. Yeah. 
No. I mean, you get chemicals, and they don't list this, that you get two chemicals that mix together, and it creates one for dioxane. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's another great point. They are not cross-testing these things. And, yeah. and think of, of, I'm just thinking about my face routine. Well, if all the things I'm putting on my face, they're probably fine. Yes. But when you put them together, maybe not. Right. Huh. Well, but also too, but they're also mixing two chemicals in there and they don't put what the end product is going to be. Oh, okay. So they're actually doing it. So they're actually doing it. Okay. Wow. In their products. So you know, the end product then comes out to be one four dioxane and they're not listing that as an mm -hmm. ingredient because they right. didn't put it in there. <laughs> so are you I guess me? technically that's correct, but that doesn't seem like the spirit of the law. <laughs> well, there is no law. There is no law. There's no regulation in the cosmetic mm -hmm. industry, that's personal right. care products. They can put anything they want into personal care products and they do. Mm-hmm. And they don't have to. Yeah, I just have to ask for forgiveness if something goes wrong. Oh, that one dropped dead. I guess we better <laughs> yeah. stop using that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Europe, they have what's called the precautionary principle. Right. Yeah, Europe is a very different place. They deal with yeah. very differently than we do. I know. My stepdaughter is over in Germany right now, and she'll bring products home, like, you know, the same products we have here, but they're for they're Germany. They're completely different. And I'm looking at the ingredients going, this is the same company. Mm -hmm. How can this be? I don't fully great. understand it. It can't be that much cheaper to have one formulation in one place and one formulation in another. Why wouldn't they just also give us the clean formulation? The bottom line. That's, yeah. that's it right there. So, so does the gut biome play a major role in things like obesity, type 2 diabetes, cancer, autoimmune diseases? What are we talking? Yeah, all of those. Actually, really? going back to our discussion on the cesarean sections, one of the really interesting outcomes that have come out of the studies in Colombia is that women who are suffering from obesity, when they give birth via cesarean section, it's actually protective for their children. Their children are less likely to get obesity. Yeah. So there, there, there are good and bad things about cesarean. Wow. Yes. And so they're living in the same household, right? Eating the same foods. Most of their exposures are the same, but they don't have this quote unquote obesogenic gut microbiome. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That is really interesting. Oh, wow. Okay. Imagine if we could bottle that, right? Like here, now we have a treatment for those people because you know, so many people really do eat healthy and they, they try and they're still struggling. So there's clearly something else there. Um, and I, I personally believe the gut microbiome plays a large part of that. So if we could have a pill or a treatment, I, I know they're working on things like fecal material transplant, which maybe isn't so attractive, but if we could- I'm sorry, no, I just, I just, <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, they're doing it now for things that can kill you, which, okay, sign me up, better than death. But if it's like an optional thing where I'm, I'm mm, I don't know, Probably There's not just something gross that. about that. <laughs> just, yeah. just saying. Absolutely. I do not disagree. Because, I mean, I know. I mean, I live whole food plant-based. Mm -hmm. I mean, 100%. And I know Dr. Barnard has talked a lot about, you know, some of the, the genetics involved. Like one study that he had done that there was a subgroup that just really had a tough time following the, the lifestyle. And like they mm -hmm. did it on, on both of the, the groups, you know, the control group and the, the variable. And he's like, yeah, there was this one, you know, gen genome that they all shared. And I'm like, that's my family. <laughs> that's my family. Because my family, I mean, my entire family on both sides is morbidly obese. Mm. And, you know, and I'm the only one who's changed. But I still, I mean, like, and I eat, I mean, like my diet is pristine, whole food, plant-based. And it's been that way for a while. But I still can't, I mean, like, like my, my fat and I, we've been together for, you know, I don't want to give up the mothership. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and that's very common. That is not, it's not, that's not even like a small number of, of people who have obesity. That's very common. It's just something that you are kind of going to have to live with or do something more drastic, like for instance, bariatric surgery. That is one way that people have been able to overcome those. But part of the reason that bariatric surgery works is it changes the gut microbiome. Really? Yes. In what way? 
So the way the, the, the gastric bypass procedure in particular is performed, there's actually cross-pollination from the intestines into the stomach and back again. Yeah. So there's what? a physical, it's, it's kind of like a fecal material transplant, but of yourself and, and other actions of the surgery are working as well. But that's right. one of the things that seems to be the most long lasting is the gut microbiome looks different. But anybody that I know that has done the bypass, they lose weight for mm -hmm. a minute and then it comes back. Well, it is a tool. And I think that's the failure of a lot of healthcare providers for not explaining that it's just a tool and you have to do a lot of work to make it work, particularly in the long time. You should talk to Chuck Carroll. The weight loss champion. He is the example of how it is done. It is a tool that you use to your advantage and then you change your lifestyle. Right. And you can't just go back. Right. Right. And I think oh. some people think, oh, I'm going to get the surgery. I'm going to lose some weight and then I'm going to go back to eating my crappy diet. And that's not how it works. It's never going to work that way. No, you have to change. You have to change what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did. I mean, he yeah. he lost like a person. 300 like, pounds. Did he? Yeah, something it, insane. It was 200, I think it was 270. I did an interview with him. And so it's on my YouTube channel if anybody wants to see or my, my website, Simply Plant Based. But it, he's so inspirational. And he does the PCRM, the exam room podcast. Mm -hmm. I've so, been on there a couple times. Yes. I love Chuck. He's amazing. <laughs> he he's is. so fun. He did yeah. it right. He did it right. And he's exactly. like the only person I know that has kept the weight off. But mm -hmm. every, everybody else that I know, and I know a lot of people that have done this, mm -hmm. and they just gain the weight right back because they're not changing what, how they got that weight to begin with. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. So what is the most effective treatments for people who are suffering from serious imbalances in their gut microbiomes? So that's going to sort of depend on, on what exactly they're suffering from. One example is IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, mm -hmm. or inflammatory bowel syndrome. One of the biggest treatments right now that we're using is a low FODMAP diet. So FODMAPs essentially are a highly fermentable type of fiber. So fiber is generally good, but you can have too much of a good thing. And in this case, that's what's going on here, is these fibers get into the gut and they're so highly fermentable that the the particular gut microbiome of these IBS patients, they just go crazy and they're fermenting it. And so they're producing gas and they can cause diarrhea, cramping, bloating, all sorts of symptoms. So what you do is you take all of that out of the diet for a period of time. You let the gut microbiome change. So what are you taking out of the diet? The, the like classic example is garlic and onions. They yeah. have a lot of FODMAPs in them. So you're just temporarily taking these all out of the diet. It's not, it's not an easy diet to follow. It's very difficult, but it's only temporary. So you right. do that to the gut microbiome changes, and then you can start slowly introducing them back to the gut, and you shouldn't have symptoms, or at least not to the level that you had before. Okay. So that's a pretty, I mean, it, it, if you ask anyone who's doing it, it's not easy, but that's a relatively easy compared to, say, having to have a surgery or some other procedure. Right. This is something you can do at home. Well... Once you hit that magical 50, the doctors want you to do a colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just got to tell you, that is just not fun. I, I have had one. And I agree. It is not fun, <laughs> but very important. Screening is very important. Not going to argue. But <laughs> what is that doing to the gut biome? So you are not the only one who had this question. And obviously it was a, it's a big concern for people who are concerned about gut health, which are the doctors that are telling you to go get these colonoscopies. Um, and so it has been studied, but here's another one of those great things where the microbiome is pretty resistant to change. Yay. So about 14 days afterwards, it's completely back to normal. Really? So whatever it was prior to the colonoscopy, completely back to normal, which is kind of amazing when you think about it, because they are literally cleaning you out. Yeah, but that's some nasty stuff. That's some, like, it's bad. Hurt. like, that is just cleaning to beat the band. Yeah, but you think of it, it's really only, like, two days. So that's a short period of time for your gut microbiome. So yeah. then it just starts coming back, and as long as you get back to a, whatever diet you were on before that was healthy and feeding it, it will come back no problem. Uh, some people, it was even less than 14 days. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, it made me feel a little bit better because, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, wow. 
because I was really concerned about that after you know I had the last one. And I'm like, mm-hmm. and no one could give me an answer. You know, really. Yeah, I I think that the the study was probably only in like the last couple of years. Well, Dr. Frame, this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation, and I thank you so much for taking the time to be with me today. Absolutely, thank you for having me.